Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Connors, pronouns she, her, and I am one of the co-directors of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary arts space focused on community, connection, and continued learning. The Notebooks Collective believes that Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are on the lands of the Kickapoo, Nipmuc, Agawam, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket tribes. Native peoples across the world continue to preserve and celebrate their cultures, and we encourage you to support Native writers and artists. And as we do this land acknowledgement, we want to recognize those who are suffering from conquest and terror in the Middle East and Ukraine. Our thoughts are with them. We know that these are very stressful times, and we are glad that you have taken time out of your schedule to join us tonight to celebrate community. I now welcome Lisa to introduce our pre presenters tonight. Thank you, Becca. Hi, everyone. Um, this is I. I feel so lucky that I get to do this. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start. Um, it's funny to me how connections are made. I met Michael Kleber Diggs because the library I work at has a robust writing community and brings authors in for a variety of programs. And Michael accepted an invitation from the library to participate. I was lucky enough to work at Michael's events and I fell in love with his work, but even more so, I was in awe of how he connected with the audience, how he answered questions with candor and heart and how he leads a workshop. I was ecstatic when he accepted our invitation to plan an in-conversation event and even more ecstatic when he in turn invited Danusha Lamaris to join him. Anyone who titles a collection, The Moons of August is immediately someone I want to know. And then I started reading her poems. First, the poem Thinking was my favorite, then Nightbird, then Small Kindnesses, and then Bonfire Opera, the title poem of her second collection, because I just cannot stop thinking about these last lines. And even though I was young, somehow in that moment, I heard it, the song inside the song. And I knew then that this was not the hymn of promise but the body's bright wailing against its limits. A bird caught in a cathedral, the way it tries to escape by throwing itself again and again against the stained glass. Needless to say, Becca and I are both thrilled that Michael and Danusha have joined us here tonight. And now I'm gonna read their official bios. Michael Kleber Diggs, he, him, his, is currently writing a memoir about his complicated history with lap swimming called My Weight in Water, which is forthcoming with Spiegel and Grau. He is a 2023 through 2025 Jerome Hill Artist Fellow in Literature, a poet, essayist, literary critic, and arts educator. His debut poetry collection, Worldly Things, published by Milkweed Editions in 2021, won the Max Ritvo Poetry Prize the 2022 Hefner Heights Kansas Book Award in Poetry, the 2022 Balkanez Poetry Prize, and was a finalist for the 2022 Minnesota Book Award. Michael's essay, There Was a Tremendous Softness, appears in A Darker Wilderness, Black Nature Writing from Soil to Stars, edited by Aaron Sharkey, published by Milkweed Editions in 2023. His poems and essays appear in numerous journals and anthologies. Michael is married to Karen Kleber Diggs, a tropical horticulturalist and orchid specialist. They are proud of their daughter who recently graduated from SUNY Purchase with a BFA in dance performance with a concentration in composition. Danusha Lamaris, a poet and essayist, was raised in Northern California, born to a Dutch father and a Barbadian mother. Her first book, The Moons of August, published in 2014, was chosen by Naomi Shihab Nye as the winner of the Autumn House Press Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the Milt Kessler Book Award. Some of her work has been published in the Best American Poetry, The New York Times, Orion, The American Poetry Review, The Kenyan Review, Plowshares, Poetry, and Prairie Schooner. Her second book, Bonfire Opera, published by University of Pittsburgh Press Pitt Poetry Series, was a finalist for the 2021 Patterson Poetry Award and recipient of the Northern California Book Award in Poetry. 
She was the 2018 through 2020 Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz County, California, and is currently on the faculty of Pacific University's Low Residency MFA program. Her third book, Blade by Blade, is forthcoming from Copper Canyon Press. And now I turn everything over to Michael and Danusha. Hello, friend. <laughs> Hello. How are you? <laughs> really good. And so good to be here with your shiny face and haloed visage over there and with other familiar faces in the room. Love I'm... this picture. It's just a <laughs> crown. It does. It's really very, very well placed and very appropriate. <laughs> well, so good to see your smiling face. Me too. And I also thought your daughter just left for college. I don't understand what's happening. How this... did she finish already? Yeah. <laughs> what is time? Oh. <laughs> I was thinking earlier today, okay, you know how you buy a car and then you start seeing that car all over the place? Yeah. All right. So you and I met when we read together at a reading series called The Wild and Precious Life or something like that. It's a, Dustin Berkshire puts it together and he's based in Florida. That's right. And I joined and I was so excited to be part of it and I... Had not heard of you before. Hor we horrified. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we were with other readers and everyone was great. And you started to read. And I just remember thinking, I don't know, it's that Jack Johnson, Curious George song. I can tell that we were going to be friends because we were just I, like touching on a lot of the same themes. Yeah. Connected <laughs> after that. And we taught together and read together another time. And, traded emails from time to time. This poetry world is so small and lovely sometimes. It, it really can be. And I feel exactly the same way about you. I remember the same trajectory that you remember. And I just thought, I, I like this person. I like them for my whole life already. <laughs> so oh, easy. That. All of a sudden I was seeing you everywhere. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I'm like, how did I not see this S-Class Mercedes before I bought one? And and now, like, just everywhere. I, by the way, I, I have an old Chevy. I don't have a S-Class Mercedes. But my point is, <laughs> once I met you, I got to run into you all the time, which is wonderful. Now we just always do. And yeah. now I am just so excited to hear you read your work. And I even have requests and stuff because mm -hmm. um, I just love the way that you touch on roots and family and nature kind of and culture all at once. And I don't know how you do that, but it makes me want you to read The Grove. Grove. Okay. Is that a decent, like, is that a doable request? Page 67? 100%. 100%. And I happen to have it right here. <laughs> But also, it just feels so good for today. Um, I have been thinking a lot about, um, as we came into the conversation, thinking yeah. about the Middle East, yeah. just the complicated world that we live in today. Um, there's so much heaviness and so much to be concerned about. And um, I know in my writing, I keep returning to the same three themes over and over and over. I'm always writing about intimacy, community, and empathy. Those mm -hmm. just that I I try like crazy to write a poem about something else. And it it always turns around to that. And in fact, um, The Grove was a poem that I started um wanting to write about trees riding on the city bus. That was my goal. Uh, because while on the bus specifically what if trees could ride the bus and um, there was a contest here to have poems made into broadsides for that would go on trains and light rail train cars and buses and I'm like I have to have a poem in oh, a yeah. car or bus and so I was camping and kept seeing these strange trees and I'm like I'm gonna write a poem where trees are riding the bus I love that it's called The Grove. Thank you for asking me to read it. Oh, 
My pleasure. The growth. Planted here as we are. See how we want to bow and sway with the motion of earth and sky. Feel how desire vibrates within us as our branches fan out. Promise entanglements rarely touch. Here are sweet rustlings. If only we could know how twisted up our roots are, we might make fast shelter together. Cooler places, verdant spaces, more sustaining air. But we are strange trees, reluctant in this forest. We oak and ash, we pine, the same, the same, not different. All of us reach toward star and cloud. All of us want our share of light, just enough rainfall. Gorgeous. Gosh, I really felt that, Michael. Oh, thank you. I felt so lucky as that poem arrived and as I was working on it and seeing possibilities and um, just how it, it, I really was just trying to be silly, <laughs> like uh, coming into it with that kind of wild idea. And um, beneath that, of course, there was something else that I wanted to, to say and wanted to talk about. And I love how poetry brings that forward. I'm I'm so hard pressed not to ask you to read Bonfire Opera because I love that poem too. And Lisa brought it up. And um, it's so beautiful, uh, that awareness that we kind of come into and how those moments lead us into realizations. I, I wondered if you would share that one. I will. I like that we're just asking. It Isn't this the easiest way to give a reading to not choose anything? <laughs> <laughs> to just have requests it's kind of great I mean I wrote a little list of things like oh I could read that but I love not actually knowing what will happen um gosh my last memory of or one memory I have of this poem is of reciting it at the top of my lungs in downtown San Antonio with another poet I just met who recites poetry for a living and um and we were just sort of yelling it downtown as the pandemic was starting and no one was really down there. And it was kind of an ecstatic memory. Was it during AWP? Yeah, which I didn't go to because of the beginning of the virus, but I was spending time with Naomi Shibnai and she was going. So that's not like really logical. Uh, at that P. What was that? Her for the first time at that AWP. Oh my gosh, we almost met. Uh huh. <laughs> we could have, could have, would have, should have almost met. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and read this. Um, bonfire opera, and this is based in a true tale, based in in those days. There was a woman in our circle who was known not only for her beauty, but also for taking off all her clothes and singing opera. And sure enough, as the night wore on and the stars emerged to stare at their reflections on the sea and everyone had drunk a little wine, she began to disrobe, loose her great bosom, and the tender belly, pale in the moonlight, the Viking hips, and to let her torn raiment fall to the sand as we looked up from the flames. And then a voice lifted into the dark, high and clear as a flock of blackbirds, and everything was very still the way the congregation quiets when the priest prays over the incense and the smoke wafts up into the rafters. I wanted to be that free inside the body, 
the doors of pleasure opening one after the next, an arpeggio climbing the ladder of sky. And all the while, she was singing and wading into the water until it rose up to her waist and then lapped at the underside of her breasts. And the aria drifted over us, her soprano spare and sharp in the night air. And even though I was young, somehow in that moment, I heard it the song inside the song. And I knew then that this was not the hymn of promise, but the body's bright wailing against its limits. A bird caught in a cathedral the way it tries to escape by throwing itself again and again against the stained glass. I make one thing with you about my reaction to that poem the first time I encountered it, which I think was in the New York Times. Um, before I read it, I had never thought of stained glass in any other way other than within the setting of a church. And the poem make me all, made me also just think about, um, because, you know, we, we begin with, I wanted to be that free in the body. Yeah. And then we come to the cage and then we come to that ending, which has so many possibilities. And it really resonates and endures. It, of course, it's the titular poem of that wonderful book because it just, it yeah, it's just great. Thank you. That's one of the ones I like to share a little bit about process when we're in an intimate group like this, but that's one of the ones that I just couldn't find the ending to. I just kept seeing a bird and I had no idea. And I really had to just stay with it as opposed to those poems where you write them. Sometimes you have the ending when you're even getting close to it. You just, you hear it, you know, those last lines. And this was like, what, <laughs> what's happening? Why am I writing about this? And it, it took a while, but it did come. Say more. It took a while. Like how long? I have no idea. I am the clipboard goddess, which by which I mean, and some of my students know this, I just walk around or, you know, with a clipboard. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> with a clipboard in my bag that has all these drafts on it. So I was walking around with that poem on my clipboard so that if I had a moment to sit at a cafe and work on it, I could. I could keep staring at that almost ending or different versions and scribbling them on them. And so I must have walked around like that for six months or more with it on there. Could have been a year. I didn't keep track of it. Yeah. You know, the Grove um, helped me think about process differently. Uh, so it it was selected and rode around in buses and light rail train cars. And my friends were so kind, like, uh, with the poem and the take selfies with the poem in the background. And it was uh, such a wonderful time. And thinking about poems, leaving your desk to have conversations with people that you may not ever meet and, and feeling really great about that. And uh, my wife was kind enough to have it framed and she put it up in our, in our bathroom. Is that okay to share? Lisa, edit that later if it's like, uh, uh and, and so Sometimes when I'm in that room, I'll, it's just right there. And I see it over and over and over and over. And when it was in the um, buses, it was called the Green Line, which is the name of one of the um, light rail lines. And for the book, I, I changed it to the Grove. Uh, but you see it all the time. It's there all the time. And new possibilities start to arrive. I didn't make a lot of changes, but I did notice some opportunities uh, so that the, the version in the book is different from the version in our on our wall. And um, that has changed my editing process. And when I have a poem that's almost ready, but that I don't feel settled in, uh, I have found not quite the clipboard, but going back, going back, going back, making micro revisions. Um, 
Yes. Starting to see opportunities and possibilities has um, really allowed for a lot. Uh, and, and so that's become kind of a part of my process too. I love that you said micro revisions because I think revision can feel very heavy. It's a heavy idea. I have to re-see this. I have to see it anew, revision it. And when it's, I call it tinkering and you have this micro revision term. If you think, oh, I'm just doing tiny little changes, so small, but you keep doing them. It's a great way to evolve a poem without it, stressing well, out. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, yeah, they could yield a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, I had a poem actually, it's okay. new, um, that, that fits well with that because uh, I was looking at it today and thinking about reading it. And um, I have not officially started working on a second poetry book, but kind of. Um, I'm starting to notice that a lot of what I'm writing about is a gathering around the same kind of theme and the theme is family. And I think that that's connected to our daughter taking up residency in New York and uh, the nature of our parenting changing because she's not here at the house with us anymore. And I've just been writing about um, our time with her at home quite a lot. And uh, there was, anyway, so I, I'll read a poem. I'll tell you, it's a Sestina. Um, and we, we can talk about all that later. I'm, I, I'd like to write in form sometimes, probably 10% of the time. And um, anyway, this is a poem called Advice on Overcoming Injuries. And just as a content warning, I talk about the death of my father uh, in the poem. And my father died. He was killed. So that comes up in the poem and just wanted to let you know that. Um, and the poem itself is about an ankle injury that my daughter, uh, so like her first injury as a dancer. Uh, and it's called Advice on Overcoming Injuries. I have a complicated relationship with mantras. Once a wise woman told me your mind is in service to you. I'm not convinced that's true. For example, let's say I suffer an injury. By the way, this came up during a talk with my daughter. While I'm hurting, if I want to, can I become healed? Can I speed my recovery by saying I'm healed? When I was nine, I repeated a phrase like a mantra. I still haven't told that story to my daughter. Back then, I didn't think about controlling my mind. My father was killed, and that hurt like an injury. I chanted, I'm the strongest boy alive, until it was true. Or, to be honest, until I thought it was true. I was still recovering. I only thought I was healed. I dreamed past grief like I could beat all injuries. I was a child. I didn't know repetition made mantras. I had overcome nothing but seemed strong in my mind, and I thought about this as I talked with my daughter. As I thought about what I should say to my daughter who wondered if what we suggest becomes true, and if pain can exist mostly in our mind. She asked, should I say I'm healing or I'm healed? Dad, which one will make a better mantra? Which one will help me recover from injuries? And I considered all the ways we are injured, wanting to say the right thing to my daughter who was back then experimenting with mantras, setting her intentions and hoping they'd come true, wanting and needing to actually be healed, but trusting reality over thoughts in her mind. Then replied, as you ask that, what's on your mind? 
She said, I want to recover from injuries, but I'm still doing that. So I can't stay, I'm healed. And here's a difference between me and my daughter. At her age, I wasn't so focused on truth. I had left my reality to put faith in mantras. Back then, my mantra worked only on my mind. I believed it was true until my next injury. So I advised her to rest. Rest until you are healed. Oh, Michael, just slay me. Oh. That's just so tender. And what strikes me about your poems, and this one included, is how they are, they're necessary in the sense that I feel they're written because someone needs to hear them. Not just as an exercise or an amusement. Um, but I feel that so profoundly here that the speaker is telling this because they need to hear their own poem and then the daughter needs to hear it and then all of us need to hear it. All those layers. Yeah, thank you. I'm so happy you're writing another book. <laughs> I Well, I keep from singing, right? So it's... Uh... <laughs> my process for worldly things, I was just writing poems as I walked around and trying to see ways that my voice might show up in poetry and um, getting a sense for that and working with a mentor, Juliet Patterson, who's uh, will forever be the most important writer in my life. And then starting to think about possibilities for how the poems I had been writing could be in conversation with each other. And, um, putting the book together, which took forever, the arrangement, the editing, and all those types of things. But that process of just writing poems as I walk around is, is something that um, I, I, I feel is just kind of part of, I, I can't, I literally, I can't help it. <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm, I've just been doing that since 2021 when Worldly Things came out and the poems, can, they can be about anything and often they are. Um, but I started to notice here pretty recently that I'm writing a lot about my mother, about uh, marriage, about um, our daughter, about our time here together as a family, about significant moments for me as a parent, um, and feeling some energy kind of gather gather around that theme toward what st starts to feel like, well, oh, if I've got 25, um, you know, what happens if I lean further into that and, and see what's possible, that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. So. And I want to picture this. I want to be able to picture what you mean, writing poems as you walk around. Are you <laughs> talking them into something? Are you just thinking them and then writing that down later? Are you writing around with a notebook, risking walking into um, street signs? Like what, <laughs> what kind of, how does it look? Yeah, the answer is yes. Really? I'm all over the place. I, I I used to feel really shy about saying to it, saying it, but I was listening to a New Yorker poetry podcast, and Kevin Young was talking to Margaret Atwood. Mm, and wow, I, these two people have it totally together. Like they're always working from the same journal. What is it at a desk? There's I imagine tea. And oh like, yeah stuff but nope it's notes app google doc microsoft word journal scrap of paper uh, voice recorder it's all yeah. of it i'm kind of the same way i also um so i got a lot of kryptonites and we don't have enough unfortunately we don't have enough time to get into all that but i do have some superpowers and one of them is if I am captivated by idea, an idea, I will not lose it. In fact, that's how I know it's captivating. Something happens in the moment that it happens. I know I'm going to write about it. Wow. Um, and uh, it can be uh, days, weeks, or months later, but, but I do. That uh, is impressive because most of us would lose the thread 
uh, approximately five seconds later. <laughs> so, you know. Very, very lucky. Um, and that was it's true for me. Um, when I was a younger writer, it was different. Oh, yeah. it's interesting how process changes. Mine is more staccato as well, that it could look like Literally, while I'm teaching a class and we're doing free write, I might be muted and talking into my uh, voice record, my memo note stuff. Um, I I was looking at a poem I published recently, and I went, "When did I write that?" Oh, while I was teaching, oh. you know, just <laughs> in the app. But often I sit and write, you know. But it looks different all the time. Which yeah. we read another poem. I will. I have one in mind let's see i like to put um the new book in a sparkly binder i have a real weakness for pretty binders huh? i go around like teaching at pacific university where i know some of these lovely folks from and i'm giving a lecture out of my sparkly sparkly binder okay um the thing about oh there it is good i am starting to know my way around the new uh, manuscript, which I feel good about. Yeah. This also touches on loss, um, as as did yours, um, though around my son. And I find that losses become a constant companion in the writing. I used to think I'd write about such things and then they would, uh, I, then I would move on or something, but it's not really quite like that. Yeah. Just changing in relationship finding the different flavors of of grief or I don't know flavor flavors haunts these days we like to walk the old neighborhood down the crisscross streets by the dog park past the harbor past Linda's Seabreeze Cafe past my old house a not much to look at beach shack built for summer, where the ghost of me still tends my old life. Roses in the garden, laundry on the line, my son in his wheelchair, head tilted up as I spoon that morning's puree. I can still hear the neighbor warming up his diesel truck, the clack of kids next door setting their skateboards on the sidewalk, at night, the salt water lament of seals as I lie in bed, looking out the window at the shadowed green. It's been a year or 10, no, 20. A man I did not know then holds my hand as we pass the front yard where the new people have planted poker, daylilies, Mexican sage, I miss the way the light came through the living room at midday. The pine out front they had to cut down because it wanted to lift the house up by the foundation, into the air. I thought there was another life, a better one. My son's eyes were dark as earth. We had to hold him close at night in case he had a seizure. I would have said then it was torture to love someone you couldn't save. But what did I know? How lucky it was. How lucky it always is to love someone at all. I'm kind of I'm devastated and consoled by that poem kind of at the same time. I think this is a, a huge part of why I felt drawn to you in that first meeting. Um, <clears throat> because you inhabit this uh, this loss and possibilities both at the same time. And that's something I'm always hoping I can find a way to do. Uh, and and that 
a poem and I don't I don't want to talk about it technically, but I'm just there's there's something about specificity, about puree, about salt water that really radiates and that swirl of time, the way time itself kind of has no meaning. Um, you know, grief is uh, an onion is not maybe the most elegant way to think about it, but it's just there's layers and layers and it reveals itself over time and it's the same and different. Um, and that, you know, one year ago, no 10, actually it was 20, um, also feels very familiar. Uh, yeah. All, all of us who've lost, who, which is all of us, time is so strange and irrelevant. And I, I do remember, though, the poet Dana Joya saying that he and his wife had lost an infant child son if I remember correctly and they had this feeling of when it would have been his 21st birthday or 18th I can't remember which a feeling like oh now we've moved into a new territory because this is when he would have been out of the house mm -hmm. and I was so grateful for that poem he wrote a poem about it and I heard him speak about it and later spoke to him personally about it but I also felt that and strangely, I was asked to read at a high school, my high school, old high school, at the graduation of the year my son would have, oh God, now I'm getting emotional, the year my son would have graduated, had he been, uh, you know, uh, in a physical form where he could have had a high school experience and all of that, um, which wouldn't have been the case for us. But it was such a full circle moment to read at that graduation and feel like I was blessing his cohort as they became adults. And what were the chances that they would ask me to be the speaker? And what were the chances it would be that year? And life just has, it talk about cycles. It's like, this is a cycle. I graduated, you know, I had this child and his life cycle completed, but the cycles of time continue with him a part of it. And I think poems allow us to carry forth our, our dead, to carry forth our beloveds, to carry forth so many things that we and, bring with us. Yeah, return and return and return to the house, right? right. To, the, to the age to the memory, um, yeah, that really resonates. If it's okay, how, how did your book come together, this this next one? Um, I don't really know, except that I kept writing poems, which is ah. what we need to do. Um, and even though I found my slivers of time less uh, generous than they used to be, um, I was what I used to call, or what I love to call a stay-at-home poet. <laughs> meaning my husband worked as a social worker and we were just kind of broke <laughs> and, and I wasn't working much except to teach one poetry class out of my living room but I was reading for hours a day and I was writing maybe a couple hours a day and so it was lush yeah. my writing time used to be lush now it is it's not like that but I have slivers of time. So I've been writing in those slivers. Sometimes I have an evening where I can sit for an hour and a half and really focus on just a poem. But I'm often answering emails for an hour and a half or <laughs> teaching classes or doing stuff. But it's somehow I was shocked to look down and see, you know, a stack of poems that were not unrelated to each other. They seemed to be related. So I make these little notes on index cards, like what are my themes? <laughs> what What is this looking like? Does this look like a collection or just random pile? And so I will do as you do, where you're like, here's my main three themes. Um, I'll tend to do that, to name them, and then to see how they're holding together. And I also want to know that they're evolving. Right. Right? That's the secret hard thing is to go okay here's 40 something poems 
but by the end, is something different happening? This poem, for example, is toward the end. And so it helps me to find the poems when I know that, oh, this poem is about looking back. So there's a good chance I placed that toward the end. I'm seeing things differently now. I used to think it was torture to love someone you couldn't save. Well, what's now? What do I think about that? How do right. I feel? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. I'm what in what I call the the margins of the day. Like, right. This is the time I have. Um, I have all these jokes about myself also. Like if I ever need to write a poem, all I need is a deadline on any other thing. <laughs> Anything else. Now I actually, I have to write this poem. Like that, that is like the, the upside of procrastination. Like it, it really is. The urgency that comes. This other thing off, I'm now going to do uh, this core thing, which is fun. <laughs> yeah. oh. I'd love to hear another one of your poems. Okay. That you wrote probably in the margins of your day. Sure. <laughs> um, all right. Thanksgiving is a super complicated holiday. By the way, all of our holidays are complicated, with the possible exception of Arbor Day. Even there, I think I might be able to find like a, a complication or a concern, but um, I love Thanksgiving mainly because I love a day off and time with family. I love food. Um, you and I have talked about food, by the way. I know. <laughs> and, and food, we were teaching about it, like how food can inform culture and conversations about family and self. So this is a, um, a poem I'm calling Bounty. Uh, yeah, bounty. Granddaddy carves the turkey. You should see his hands. Layers of sun for brown, burgundy brown, mahogany brown. Fingers crooked like tired fence posts. Multicolored nails, mostly rust, jagged and shorn. Knuckles like golf balls. Hardly any bend to them. Hardly any need to bend past what the, what they can do, which is a lot. Directly across from him, Grandmommy is fluid grace. Brow glistened up, hair just so, eyes hard at work, making sure nothing is missing. Face soft with fatigue, face soft with gratitude, arms soft, hands. All this bounty of creation, her creation. The tiny house, huge. The dining room expands into their living room. Everyone still here is here, gathered around one table. Grandmommy, granddaddy, mommy, but not dad. Both aunts and my uncle, two of their spouses, all nine of their kids, everyone seated together, packed in tight. If I lower my hands, I'll have to wait until dinner is done to raise them again. Heads bow. The good Lord makes some assurance. Plates pass in a rehearsed dance. Our family's choreography. This day so familiar. This day so different. Everyone gets as much as they want of whatever they want. We have food enough for days. It wasn't always so. But that was before me and even before mommy. I take an extra roll and too much butter. I claim a fat drumstick. Everything is delicious. Everything is salted just right. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so lovely. And where is my hot buttered bread I, roll right now? I brought, <laughs> I'll send you one. Thank you. That's That should have been a trigger warning. Yeah. I mentioned hot buttered <laughs> rolls. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And that if I don't raise my hand now, you know, no hope. <laughs> don't, don't put them down. They're not going to get back up. <laughs> I love that so much. It, you feel just this real crush of family um, with all that feast and in it, the, the loss inside of that, of who's there and who's not there. But the, that's the feast, isn't it? Yeah. That's the feast of life. Right. Who's and who's not yep and this is a memory and some of those people are not here now some of the people who were are not and this is 
part of 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 life um but it's also part of the power of memory uh which i cherish a chance to kind of think about uh that moment and those people in that room and that house and how many gatherings we had there and all the family stuff that didn't make it into the poem um you know the, another oh. poem <laughs> <laughs> My, the, hold on just a second <laughs> <laughs> yeah it might be it might be another poem um, <laughs> exactly exactly oh, I just love that so much the way that as a writer and as a poet we get to um salvage these moments that otherwise would just be lost those particular family dinners right they just disappear into the stream it's like lifting a stone out of the stream and going, I'm, I'm saving this one. Right. For later. And yeah. hand it to someone else. Right. Um, so there's a real beauty in how a poem like that salvages time. Hey, okay, your turn. <laughs> I, I'm going to look at our time. Speaking of time. Um, how are we doing? Yeah, I forget when we do our little Q&A time, because I want to make sure there's time for that. 8.35, which is 5.35. 10 minutes from now? Okay. Okay, that's, this is what I do. I print things out. <laughs> oh, okay, bravo. I'm going to, I'm going to take, it. yep. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now I have no idea what I'm going to read, because I like the way we're just sort of going back and forth um from stuff we've got stuff we've got yes i've been wanting to read this one but i feel like i don't want to keep being so on theme with you but things that i chose and wrote down just keep relating to stuff that you're doing so i'm just gonna go with that i'm not gonna fight it good um, so this is called Blue Note. <clears throat> it's a newer poem from the, the new book also, but it has to do with these days in Oakland. My, my brother lived in Oakland. We grew up in Berkeley and Marin. And when we were young adults and we would cook all the time at his house. And uh, I guess sometimes I'd house it for him. So I knew all his plants and all their names. I get into that in the poem. And and my brother is one of those people who's also no longer with us, but there's just something about, yeah, I guess I'm salvaging some of those days, our young adulthood days. And uh, I take my customary sip of fennel tea. Brilliant. My, my best friend teaches voice and public speaking. And she told me all these things not to do before giving a reading. And I did a reading where I think I did all the things like I ate yogurt you're not supposed to do that I drank alcohol you're not supposed to do that. I did like <laughs> all the things not on purpose and kind of went oh I think it went okay <laughs> yeah. who knows now I'm drinking fennel tea okay blue note my brother named all his house plants after jazz musicians so when he left town he'd say can you water miles Coltrane's getting cold by the window. Give Billy a little extra drizzle, but let her dry out. Was there a Nina? I can't remember. But I know Mingus had broad, glossy leaves, and Cassandra had a pink tint to her foliage, but was frail due to the less than tropical conditions. I'm trying to say it was music and plants and sprouted greens and my brother in the kitchen chefing up roasted beets and everyone hanging out old style oakland which was wood floors and hummus and take out ethiopian i thought we'd live like kings a dynasty from one potluck to the next it felt that way the red carpet days of our 20s I took care of those plants as best I could, put them in my own living room, fed them liquid fertilizer, and, I hoped, 
the right slant of light. I thought we'd gotten out beyond the worst of it, the story we were born to, though we both had a feeling he'd die young. But the years kept ticking, and the friends kept coming, and his children arrived, curled and new in their cribs. It was hard to see things beginning to turn, to see the signs, the mind's erasure. He started checking the locks, closing curtains, talking in low tones. Sometimes the leaves start to yellow and you don't even notice. There's a sound absence makes even before it arrives, a static in the ether, high and blue and held. So, when you're writing a poem, do you think about audience specifically? I mean, I want to feel like I'm talking to somebody. Um, it's usually not specific. I could have addressed this to him, actually. Um, but I didn't write it as an address. But I do like to feel like I'm just telling somebody a thing. Um, I'm not sort of trying to talk to the clouds only, but to, to human somebody's. So kind of like that. How about for you? Yeah, I, I heard um, John Mario talk about this once. He said for his first book, Up Jump the Boogie, he thought audience as in a, a venue. Oh, okay. And for his second book, Contemporary American Poetry, he thought listener. And one of the things I love about poetry is audience can change poem by poem. Like I can like, this is a poem to black people. This is a poem to fathers. This is a poem to my mother. This is like, it can change poem. But for the most part, outside of that, I've started to realize that um, I am writing to someone who's sitting across a table from me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the distance. And and when I hear your poem, see, in the poem that you read earlier, there's this moment where you say, um, what did I know? Yeah. In the poem that you just read, there's this other moment that I'm not going to remember that had the same kind of quietly colloquial conversational quality. It's It's not a hundred percent direct address but it brought me into an uh, imagining a specific and also at the same time general listener uh maybe it's i'm trying to say is it that line um and i'm i'm by the way uh enthusiastic about direct address i brought up john mario and oh, I his, love. eric dolphy is just like so many moments he's like um bear with me <laughs> and then there's I've been reading Louise Glick a lot lately since she passed away and then the wild iris there's this moment where she's like hear me out and it's the iris talking but at the same time I'm just like <laughs> I'm like give me a second to make my point here and I'm just like oh I love it so much and, um love that yeah but it, it allows me to think about um in that moment, I am the listener, right. um, literally, but also uh, as a reader, I become not a reader. I become a person who's receiving a specific thing from a specific other person. Um, it, it cuts out the middle thing, right? In, in a way that I, um, I really love. You know, I actually wrote a talk after reading a John Murillo poem because he does that in such a masterful way. So it's so interesting that you brought him up in that way. Yeah. He ha in his poem, Dolores, maybe the beginning of it is something like, I've never told anyone this yep. until now, until you. And he has just singled you out of all humans on the planet, right? 
and is going to tell you this story. That is so masterful and beautiful. He's really good at it. And it also, I always kind of giggle because it's a poem, but like it's written and there are line breaks and it's got all these kind of formal considerations that are included as part of it. But it's also just like, hey, yeah, stripped away from that. I'm about to tell you something I've never, yeah. In a book, it's the whole thing is spectacular. We know other people are reading it. <laughs> so we feel that it's intimate and that kind of intimacy, I think is why we we write a lot of the time, but also why we read is we wanna feel deep intimacy with the human experience. Yeah. And so we wanna know what's inside of other people and that it's kind of like what's inside of us. You know, and so there's something about that breaking that wall and just going, okay, all of that aside, here's the real deal. Yeah. That feels right in a poem. Do you ever have this? Okay, so we got a QA coming. Yes, we're at the moment. And so hold on just a second. I just got a low battery alert. So we might get oh, a no. might get a guest appearance here. Oh my gosh, I haven't even been looking at the chat, but I really want to now. Yeah. That's moment <laughs> I like that my name became a Danish that happens all the time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my... um, all right hopefully that won't become an issue here but bear with me for just a moment um, all right should we start the Q&A? Okay. We can absolutely start the Q&A. I want to encourage people to send questions in because right now um, we have Laurel's question. Let me find it real quick. Uh, Laurel asks, both writers create conflict in their work, but each in a different way. Would they describe how they build it in? Does that come first or added later on? Talk about process with respect to conflict. Ooh. Process with respect to conflict. Can you read the first part of that again? Because I had like a little brain, brain glitch while thinking sure. about it. Sure. Um, both writers create conflict in their work, but each in a different way. Would they describe how they build it in? Does that come first or added later on? Can you talk about process with respect to conflict? I guess I feel like it's happening all along. And I love that Mark Doty references what he, he calls contraries. Yeah. Just opposite, right? And I feel like as I'm writing, I'm thinking about contraries. This is something I find beautiful. This is then what is something I find ugly. How can I merge that with the beautiful? Here's something, um, here's one side of the story. So what's the other side of the story? It's just always with each line thinking a little bit in contraries. Um, that would be my response to that, that it's happening all the way through. Yeah. I, yeah. I, um, I cannot think of a, well, I can't. Think of some poems that I've written where conflict is what brings me into the poem. Two things that are, are really kind of colliding against each other. Um, and outside of that, I think what I'm really trying to do is get as close as I can to the emotion that brought me into the poem and that the emotion that was present with me at the time the specific thing I was writing about happened. Um, and that can be conveyed, I think, in a lot of ways. Some of it is that detail, the wheelchair, the puree, the salt water, like very specific things that allow us to think about love. Puree to me is, is almost a classic example of care and concern kind of present all at the same time. And um, all of our emotions are complicated. Happiness, I would say, among the more complicated ones, because there's always at the edge of it, this risk of loss. It's ephemeral, it's fragile, it's temporary. Um, and so I, I think what I'm trying to do is be 
fully present in the emotion, understanding that conflict and complexity is going to come forward as part of that. Wow. I love that, Michael, that you said happiness is among the most complicated because it's ephemeral. And that's so beautiful to, to place happiness not there as sort of a an easily brushed aside thing or, oh, happiness, what an uncomplicated state. Um, I remember reading Jane Hirschfeld talking about each happiness ringed by lions. And that carries some of that sentiment that you're holding. But also that you start with the emotion and cleave to it. Because often people say, well, I start with a story or I start with um, the things around me, an image maybe. And how we start is so individual and I love that for you it's the emotion yeah it's intangible thing that is your flashlight or your guide as you move forward through the poem you go yeah but I'm lighting this with the emotion that's at the center of it I've never heard someone say that before and Mm. I love that as a as a possibility (laughs) you know as you say um of a way forward yeah I um I I got to see the blues singer Coco Taylor in concert twice, um, which both times I was just astounded, astounded. Um, and among the things that really kind of resonated with me was she has this song called Wang Dang Doodle, which is, if if she were Journey, this would be her Don't Stop Believing. If she were Seamus Haney, this would be her Digging. It's like, <laughs> she, and not seeing Wang Dang Doodle, people would riot. Um, and so she does. And the last time I saw her was in Minneapolis. Uh, it was actually, uh, my, my wife and it was our second date. So it was 1999 and, um, she came out, there's all this show, the robe and the band getting everybody hyped up before she'll even come out and on and on and on. She finally gets to the song, which I imagine she has played 10,000 times. And, um, she sang it that night and the other time I saw her as though it were like the eighth time. Like it was that polished, but it was also that new. And sometimes for me, when I'm reading a poem, and I I imagine, Tanush, I mean, I think of you as a poet who has two viral poems. <laughs> you might have more than two, but for sure, Small Kindnesses and Bonfire Opera, just like poems everyone knows. And I'm... Um, I imagine you're asked to read them a lot, which is why I was a little bit shy about asking to read Bonfire Opera. Um, But for me, I have poems that people ask me to read, or or maybe I sometimes feel a little bit that they expect me to read. And um, I always like to pause just a little bit uh, before I read them and, and say to myself, remember where you were. Just remember where you were when uh, the idea that brought you into this poem arrived and remember where you were as the poem started to take shape. Go back to that and bring that forward into what we're doing tonight. And when I hear you read poems, the pace with which you read Von Weyer opera tonight, the intentionality of it, um, I had that same kind of impression. But, But that for me is that same emotional component kind of expressed in the the performance of the poem. If we're not re-feeling it, it's, it's not really reading of it. I feel, and, and I can make that mistake where I read something, but maybe I'm not wanting to re-feel it and I just read it, but you know, because it's vulnerable to revisit. And I know there's ways around that. There's shortcuts where you just use your voice a certain way, Um, you know, but I think that when we are allowing ourselves to visit the feeling, we're trying to fully transmit an experience of just being a human. I hear that in your reading also and, and deeply appreciate that. Thank you. We have a question from Laura. 
who writes, at the other end of the spectrum from the micro revisions you both discussed is the recognition that a poem needs to be left behind as compost. This is a subjective recognition, but I'd love to hear both of your reflections on your relationship with this part of the revision process. That's a fun question, I find. Do you wanna start in, Michael? Me go ahead, okay. I, I'm like a woman who's just trying to work out a relationship you know, every time I face those poems where I just, I want it to work. I want to give it just one more chance. And I keep them in my uh, revision files in my computer. And I, I might revisit them every week. It might be every month, then every year. <laughs> and I, I'm ever hopeful. And sometimes I, I figure out what to do with it. Uh, you know, uh, one of my first teachers was Tony Hoagland because he taught at my high school for a week. Um, but he said, sometimes the person who starts the poem is not the same person who can finish it. And he doesn't mean handing off the idea to a friend, though that might be a good idea. <laughs> it just means the person you are in that moment doesn't have the answer. And that has happened to me that a decade has gone by and then I've gone, oh, I can write that poem now or maybe it's five, six years. Oh, I'm that person now who at least has something more to say. So when I have students that have a poem that I've pointed them this way or that, or I've said, you know, get another layer here. You know, there's something that wants to open. Sometimes they're like, I can't, nothing's happening. And I'm just like, put it away and see who you are later. There are things I actually abandoned that just because I don't find them interesting anymore. So then I will abandon it. I'm not interested. Well, <laughs> you know, why work on it? But if I'm still interested, I don't totally abandon it. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? I have essentially the same answer, not too far away from me in my study where I often will read online, but it's such a mess right now, everyone. Like it, we're going to get it sorted out, but it's terrible right now. There's a wooden box and in the wooden box are a lot of the things that I wrote when I was first writing poems. Yeah. And from time to time, I'll return to the box and I'll look at some of the early things that I had written. And um, there is no prevailing reaction. Sometimes poems that I thought were pretty darn good, I think are pretty darn good now. Sometimes I think, I don't know, Michael, sometimes I think poems that were an absolute lost cause were inches away. And I see it now. Um, wow. I think it, it's still probably not likely to turn into a tremendous amount or I'm not interested in writing about it right now. But I also sometimes see um, how in the 24 years that I've been doing this earnestly, I have changed and also not changed um so i i don't it, it was super hard for me also by the way to keep them and uh, to take myself seriously as you were ending your comments Denish, i kept thinking to myself listen robert bly sold his his wooden box full of stuff and his letters and everything to the university of minnesota for eight hundred thousand dollars and that could happen to you too and oh my god he did yeah and people will see your scraps and your correspondence and all that kind of stuff and I, I I have a hard time taking myself that seriously as a writer, but I definitely keep everything because um, I, I I can see myself coming back to it. So I'm writing about family, as I said. The first poem that I wrote that I felt, hey, this is pretty good, uh, was a poem uh, where my wife, before we were parents, was walking into the house with a bunch of Roma tomatoes in her shirt. Um, and she rolled them into a, a metal colander and and the poem to me felt like a kind of fertility prayer and I I wrote that more than 20 years ago and it would not surprise me if it's in my next book um so I don't I don't compost anything I, I don't necessarily feel like that's my job I will also say this I have edited and micro revised poems uh to where they're not uh 
they're not i i've i've, I've gone past it um, and i i'm fairly disciplined about versions and saving versions so that i can go back uh to version seven before i started to overcook it um and uh and and return to the thing that's more organic and scruffy but authentic than the more technically sound metrically sound sonically interesting piece that's not not what i'm i'm, I'm trying to do so i've I'm def over revised um and i'm thankful that i have those things so i it's just the same message i try to keep everything and compost nothing I love that. And you've inspired me to get a box to put those things in, like the scribbly. I love that you said scruffy. That's the best word ever for this. But these scruffy versions and these false starts and these things that maybe are almost done, but we, we're not the person yet who can recognize that. Maybe later we will be. It's it's such a tricky, interesting business. Right. And why not keep the scraps and hope that we'll be paid $800,000 for them? That was my takeaway. <laughs> but also just to not give up on ourselves and our drafts. You never know. No. I've had an editor reject a poem. Well, no, an editor wanted to accept my poem. He, he said, I want this poem, but maybe a few changes. And I said, oh, I have a cleaned up version. And I sent him that. Um, this was Mark Drew at Gettysburg Review. And he said, oh, I don't want that. I don't want the cleaned up one. I, I want the exploded sonnet version. <laughs> Isn't that great? Where it's like all the, everything behind the rafters is showing and all the plumbing is exposed and all the fears and the messy stuff is in there. And he's like, that's what I want. And that was a real learning experience for me at that stage. Of that. You know, I also love the poems where I'm like, there's this part of the poem where I'm like, I don't know why this is in here. Um, but I also feel like it can't come out. Uh, maybe I'll figure it out later. Yeah. Not, uh, but it's telling me it wants to be in there. So it's it's going to stay. So. Yeah, kind of like being willing to be foolish in the name of art to do a thing that doesn't totally make sense and that in a, a writing group might tell you to take it out mm -hmm. um but to go well uh, i don't know it, it kind of goes in there I, I i'll see if i feel that way in six months but um kind of feeling that i have a lot of things like that too yeah i might be wrong about this but there's this jane kenyon poem called a blue ball where she's with her husband burying the cat with its bowl. Bare hand draped sand and gravel back into the hole. It fell with a hiss and thud on his side, on his fur, the white feathers that grow between his toes and his long, not to say aquiline nose. And I'm like, so I imagine I'm in a poetry group with Jane. Ha ha ha. And she brings that poem to poetry group. And I circle that line and I'm like, long, not to say aquiline nose. I don't know if it's like you're describing it, but saying it's not this thing when there's a thousand things it could, I don't know. I'd take this out. And I know for sure she would say, I'm not taking it out. And I'm so glad she didn't because the line that comes after that, I've seen it now later is almost like a look over here because I'm about to knock you out. It's long not to say Ackland knows. We stood and brushed each other off. There are souls much keener than this. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, this is a loss. And it's heavy and it's solemn and it's like big enough to write about. And also we've been married for a long time and we're not young. Um, and maybe by that time she knew she had cancer. I don't even know. But she's like, there are sorrows much keener than this. Wow. Yeah. Okay, um, but no, I, the, yeah. the, uh, I think long not to say aquiline knows and leave it in there. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I love it when that happens. I love that too. And I see as you say that line, I, I sense the awkwardness of the line and also that she's avoiding 
saying um, an aquiline nose because that would be weird to say yeah. about a cat. Right. So she undercuts it. Yeah. But there's kind of a wonderful awkwardness about it. Yeah. And then she slays you in the next line because as you say, she's distracted you, but you're focusing yeah. on the strangeness of going, well, if it's not, because it made me really picture the cat's nose much more than if she'd said it were an aquiline nose. And I cannot I mean, picture it. Cat with a nose like that, but whatever. Yeah, it, it's uh, now I, if someone said, yeah, that line should come out, I would, I would speak to them at length on why it shouldn't. Right. Yeah. We have to be a little bit wrong to be right. right. That's right. Yeah. Well, this was such a pleasure. I feel like we're coming toward the end of our allotted time, but you'll let us know, Lisa, where are we? We are. We're, we are right at the point where if you each have one more poem to read, that would be lovely. Okay. I'm sure we we do. Okay. Um, uh, do you want to go first or second? Uh, I don't have a preference. I, I don't have a, I have not decided on a thing. I'm just free floating here for a moment. Do you have one you know you want to read yet? Well, maybe. Okay, let's go for it. So this is a poem called Postcard from the Bottom of a Lake. And uh, I just, I think about it a lot. I was writing about a friend who at the time was caring for her parents and caring for her children at the same time. And uh, I am now kind of doing the same thing. Our, our daughter is making her way toward independence, living in the most expensive city in the United States. Like... Uh, trying to find jobs as a dancer and so we're, we're parenting differently but we're still parenting and um, my wife's parents and my mother are all, all getting uh, older and needing more support and and just thinking about family and um, you know anyway this is called postcard from the bottom of a lake for AL in Maiden Rock Along Pepin's north shore, a single hawk hovers in late morning sky, swift shadow across pale blue-white. Its glide suggests effortlessness. Summer now and nestlings can fly. I'm on retreat, seeking lightness and quiet here inside a cottage surrounded by windows through which I see day lilies and trees, butterflies and passerines. In my writer's thesaurus, diurnal follows ditzy, and ditzy means feather-brained. In this proximity to the word I saw it feels serendipitous. Did you know Lake Pepin exists in two states? At dusk, I'll swim there and watch ruthless birds ride the thermals. Parents free of offspring, juveniles migrating away, I'll float. Imagining myself fledged, my imagining my fledgling fledged, myself fledged. Later, when my work is done, I will dive into the vast lake sourced by a river that is always, always flowing south. Those ruthless birds. <laughs> ruthless. <laughs> I love that, Michael. Carrying us out, always south. Okay, I'll read a thing. I will read a thing. I think I'm going to read um, a poem called Nothing Wants to Suffer that came from a line um, by the poet and essayist Linda Hogan. I was reading her essays where she was talking to corn growing in the field and one of the lines that she wrote was nothing wants to suffer. And my mind did that thing where it just, I kept hearing that. Um, so I wrote this poem. Nothing wants to suffer after Linda Hogan. Nothing wants to suffer. Not the wind as it scrapes itself against the cliff. Not the cliff being eaten slowly by the sea. The earth does not want to suffer the rough tread of those who do not notice it. 
the trees do not want to suffer the axe nor see their sisters felled by root rot, mildew, rust. The coyote in its den, the puma stalking its prey. These two want ease and a tender animal in the mouth to take their hunger. An offering, one hopes, made quickly and without much suffering. The chair mourns an angry sitter. The lamp, a scalded moth. A table, the weight of years of argument. We know this, though we forget. Not the shark, nor the tiger, fanged as they are, nor the worm content in its windowless world of soil and stone. Not the stone, resting in the riverbed. The riverbed gazing up at the stars, least of all the stars, ensconced in their canopy, looking down at all of us, their offspring, scattered so far beyond reach. May we go forth and not suffer. Let's do that. Least not too much. <laughs> Please. I'm so grateful for this time. Me too. Thank you for inviting me to be your buddy in yeah. here. And thank you, Lisa and Becca, for holding this whole space. Right. It was a joy. And Becca is going to close us out tonight. Right. I am, aren't I? Okay. Well, I guess I want to say that uh, thank you, Michael and Danusha. Um, we hope that folks who are still with us will buy your books if they don't have them already. Um, we have your book links and social media in the chat. Um, want to know that we are running a class next week um, called Radical Revisioning as a Hero's Journey um, with a previous uh, In Conversations guest, uh, Sarah uh, Moore Wagner. And um, I hope that you will all check it out. And um, if everyone wants to unmute and give a round of applause, because I know there are lots of folks here that know you both, um, we'd have we'd happily love to happily hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, friends. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Uh, thanks, Laura. Good to see you. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, by composting, I didn't mean throwing away, but like literally <laughs> it's going to disintegrate and fertilize the other poems. It's still sort of oh. somewhere in the box. Hopefully that happens too. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um well thank you all for being here and um with that we will say good night thank you for being here Please, uh, bye. 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 <laughs> see you soon I hope. Yeah. I hope so too <laughs> bye Lisa do you want to hit the record oh yeah are we here for a moment I will, I will stop recording